So next up, what I've titled this is When Drug Addicts Are Treated Like Criminals, We All Lose. And this is a story that's actually a few years old. I guess it started making its way around um, the Internet again uh, for some reason. This, this, this article that was sent to me originally was written in 2015. The title of the article is 18-year-old girl dies in jail after police cue her of faking a medical emergency. So what what happened is this, and, and I'll give you the short version. You can read the article if you want. You can find more on this if you want to just by Googling her name. It's uh, Victoria Air, uh, V I C T O R I V I C T O R I A H E R R H E R R is the last name. Also known as Tori Air. She died in a Lebanon County Correctional Facility um, after police hesitated to provide her with medical care for several days. Air was addicted to heroin and began to go into withdrawal when she was taken into custody. This is a situation that could be potentially deadly if not handled with care. Sadly the, sadly, the correction officers at the jail accused her of faking and refused to get her medical care until it was too late. Uh, our family did sue. I don't know what came of the lawsuit. I haven't been able to find out if that's still pending or if they were successful or unsuccessful in suing the state, which is always a difficult thing to do. Um, the state police investigated it, which is standard procedure whenever an inmate dies in, in custody, and said that, well, don't worry about it because all of uh, her constitutional rights were protected and all procedures and protocols were followed properly. Um, so you basically have the state investigating itself and saying the state's okay to do what it did. Okay, We'll put that aside. Let's say all the procedures and protocols were properly followed. Their, their, their statement's absolutely true. Okay, then the procedures and the protocols are the trouble. The, the problem. Are they not? You have somebody addicted to heroin and they're not put under medical care during withdrawal, there's a damn good chance they're going to die. So what may you ask was this girl's huge crime that had her in our prison system in the first place and denied medical care? She was accused of selling heroin. Now, or attempting to sell heroin, I guess. Now, there's a couple things we have to look at here. Number one, They will charge you with an intent to distribute simply on a quantity. If you have a certain amount on you, they, they will say you intended to sell. Um, if a person is a heroin addict and she has fellow addicts and her friend says, well, get me some too, okay, and she gets some money from her friend and goes and buys heroin for both of them, they will also call that consider that trafficking heroin. All right. So, you know, whether or not this was even truly dealing in the way that we think of it is is debatable. Okay, This girl was an 18-year-old anorexic, which I'm sure made it more likely that she would die from these complications. But again, that makes it more necessary that you provide proper medical oversight of this person if you have them in custody. But this, this girl is not a freaking heroin kingpin, okay? This is not the girl that was a connection. This was an addict who probably would get some extra heroin and sell it to afford her next batch of heroin. This is not your typical dealer that you think of. Okay, This isn't the person with the muddled voice and the hood over their head on the Drugs, Inc. TV show. This is an 18-year-old girl that's an addict. And she's dead. And she didn't have to be. Because the state wanted to put her in prison for a crime that had no victim. You can't show me any victim here other than her. And this is the problem. Even when there's minor crimes associated with it, like dealing, which, I, as again, I don't see that as a, as long as you dealt the thing that they paid you for, I don't see a victim there, right? The victim is the addict themselves, sure, but so you, you got an addict. You, you understand when a person is addicted to heroin, they will do things that they otherwise would not do just to get more heroin because they feel that bad without it. And the problem we have in this country, specifically with heroin, is we are treating drug addicts as though they are criminals instead of sick people. These people on heroin in our country are sick and they need help. And we are not helping by throwing them into a prison population where they're treated like freaking animals. And they are left to die Because they dehydrate. I mean, that's the, I don't know if you know that or not, but the primary way that people die 
from complications from heroin withdrawal is through dehydration. They begin to have massive amounts of diarrhea. They can't get enough fluids into themselves. You know, and it, you, you, you know, they don't know what's going on, so they might not even know what they really need to be doing to look after themselves. Because their solution has always been more heroin. If we take somebody into custody that says, yes, I'm a heroin addict, they should go straight to an infirmary until they get through with withdrawals. Well, there'd be so many of them. Maybe you should arrest less of them than I don't know, right? Maybe unless you can show me their victim, they don't need to be in prison. They don't need to be in jail. Because I want to ask you, who wins? Who wins when we treat people with a drug addiction as criminals? You can say whether it should be or not. That's fine. Who wins? How do you? How is your life better because somebody who was using drugs is thrown in jail? How is your child's life better? If this happens to one of your kids, do you want them treated this way? Or do you want them given help? It won't happen to my kids. I'm sure this lady's, this lady's parents would have said that when she was 10, too. Oh, our little girl never. And, and right now, heroin is a cancer in our country. It is a complete and total cancer. And it has largely been created by the big drug manufacturers. So I know a lot of people don't really want the truth on this, but this is the truth. In the 1980s, the big drug companies funded and then, you know, publicized two major studies on opiate-based medications that came to the conclusion of if you really have pain and you're treated with opiates for that pain, you will not become addicted to opiates. Now this is this is Another time for the use of the word. This is a retarded assertion, okay? This is completely idiotic. That you can give somebody a highly addictive substance, but if they're in pain and it only alleviates their pain, then they won't become addicted to it. And, of course, this is discredited at this point. And, of course, the pharmaceutical companies are like, whoopsie, we just followed the science. Remember, it's settled silence, science, right? There is no such thing as settled science. And we don't buy into scientific studies that are paid for by the people that benefit from the results. So these drug companies made, honest to God, over 30 years, trillions of dollars on their, on their pain medications. And many people became addicted One of the most famous people to become addicted to this type of pain medication was Rush Limbaugh. And it's not because he was a pill popper to get high. It's because the guy legitimately had pain. He took it, and he needed more. And unlike a lot of people, he had an unlimited supply of money, and he could keep getting more and more and more. Because what happens with these drugs is, even if they're helping your pain, as you develop an addiction, you're now taking the drug to not feel like crap, not to get rid of the pain. Okay? By not taking the drug, you feel like shit. And it's a lot like smokers. Smokers, you, you guys really don't enjoy smoking. You become addicted to nicotine in the form of burnt tobacco. And then if you don't have cigarettes, you feel like shit. And what you think is making yourself feel good is simply making yourself not feel bad. Well, with, with something like an opiate, it's the same but a hell of a lot worse. And so what happened is millions of people were prescribed these medications and then no longer could afford them or they would, could no longer get prescriptions for them and they felt like absolute shit and the heroin market exploded right around the same time and those people went to heroin because it was cheap and easy to get. And, and let me tell you what part of America is being destroyed by heroin. The backbone of America. The small towns. The small and mid-sized towns that, that 30 years ago had their problems, but it wasn't major drug problems. Towns like I grew up in, in Pottsville, Pennsylvania. When I was in high school in Pottsville, Pennsylvania, you could, if you worked really hard at it, get meth. But most of the people that were on meth were like auto body workers and stuff that were like, work really hard so I could make more money, so I could buy more speed, so I could work really hard, so I could, like that kind of tweaker guy, right? Like... Kids didn't do speed. They just didn't, like in school. Kids drank beer, and they smoked pot. That's what they did. 
And if you would have went to a group of like kind of rougher kids, right, kind of dope heads, and said, hey, man, you want some dope? They'd be like, yeah. You want some heroin? Oh, dude, no, no, no. Okay? So I leave in 1989. I leave Pottsville, 89-90. And about six, seven years later, I'm talking to my father And he tells me that my best friend from high school's girlfriend is dead of a heroin overdose. That she died of a heroin overdose, and they had actually started to brand the local heroin, and they had these little bags with a skull and crossbones on it, and it said lethal injection on it. That was a six, seven-year period that it went from you couldn't get heroin in Pottsville. And nobody would have took it The kids are dying from it, and they have a novelty brand called Lethal Injection. And from talking to people now, it's everywhere. Like, you can't not find it. And how are we going to fix this? If you think locking up addicts and dealers is going to fix it, we've been doing that for the 30 years that it's become the problem. And it's worse now than ever. So I ask you again, who benefits when we lock up drug users? The answer is one that many of you don't want to give, but you know in your heart what it is. Nobody wins. Nobody wins when we put somebody in prison or jail for using drugs or for selling small amounts of it. Now, I'm for decriminalization of everything. And I think that would actually make fixing the problem a lot easier. Because all the resources we use to lock people up for using drugs could be used to help people that are using drugs not use drugs. I know it sounds it's crazy sounding, but like actually getting someone off drugs is something that doesn't require putting them in a cage. It requires put, putting them into, yes, a custodial relationship, but it requires medical treatment and treating the underlying reason that makes this person a drug addict in the first place. And some of you say, well, I've known addicts that have been in and out of rehab 18 times. Okay, fine. Some people have a problem that's worse than others. But many of these people, given the right opportunity, could solve these problems. They, they could get themselves back on their feet. But it takes a medical approach, not a judicial approach. And again, what I'm saying, and I believe is the case, locking up drug users and people that buy a little bit and sell it to their friends... No matter what your stance on drugs, locking those people up, nobody wins. And there are more drugs in our country today than there were 10 years ago. And 10 years ago, there was more than there was 10 years prior to that. And the war on drugs and dare and just say no and all of this shit going all the way back to the 60s, 70s, and 80s has done nothing to abate the problem at all. It's made it worse. And here's what nobody can seem to understand, basic economics. As long as this shit is illegal, there is an ass load of money in it. And all of the evil things, you'll say, but what about guns and violence and shooting children and gangs? And If it wasn't illegal, none of that shit could exist. If you legalize drugs tomorrow, you would break the back of organized crime and gang violence like that. Because there's nothing to fund it anymore. What do you think would fund gangs without drugs? Where would they get their funding from? Robbing and stealing, that's a lot higher risk, isn't it? That's a, you know, and then we'd, if we'd have plenty of room to put those people too, wouldn't we? Those crimes have victims. There, it has always been the case that the illegal substance market has been a number one way for nefarious people to fund their activities. You remove that ability. And instead of lethal injection, if somebody insists on doing heroin, they can get a known quantity of heroin that's clean, that hasn't been cut with chlorine bleach or something like that. From a freaking Walgreens. For a penny or two. And I don't think that's a good thing. I think that's a terrible thing. That people would be running around using heroin if they bought at Walgreens. But let me tell you something. I think what we have right now is a lot worse. Because we wouldn't have 18-year-old girls dying in the custody of the state because they were basically denied intravenous water. That's what this girl needed to prevent her from dehydrating. That would have saved her life. And here's the biggest tragedy in this. 
when the state of Pennsylvania says all procedures and protocols were followed, I believe them. And therefore, it is not only the people that were in the immediate care of this person who I think are responsible for her death, but the state itself is an entity. And I do hope these parents either won their lawsuit or eventually win their lawsuit. But I have my doubts because the state's pretty big on protecting itself. That's what states do.